Uh, morning, everyone. Um, I don't know how we're really going to do this because it's. Um, I thought this session was after lunch, so I was going to have a little chat with Tom to plan this. So we're going to ad libbing a little bit. Um, but it's a. Um, I suppose from our BS point of view, this thing is is massive. As Tom says, there's been um, a number of children born in the last few years since this has happened. We've had three kids in my family. Um, puts it in into perspective. Um, there's a U.S. president's term has, has started and ended, so it has taken a long time. Um, and, and and my feeling is that the whole heat sector and the whole design of systems like this. If you want to design a heating system for a building like this, it's complicated. Um, it's also pretty poorly reg or it's, it's not that regulated. And when you look at the electric market or the gas market, if you want to put a, can you hear me? Um, if you want to put a gas boiler in a house, you need to be certified to do it. If you want to fix your uh, electrical connection into your fuse board, you need to be regulated to do it. Um, and, and, and that combination of being a complicated systems and being quite unregulated means that there's been a number of issues over the year. Um, and it's going to be very hard for any scheme to be all things to all people. And my slight concern when you look over the document is that it is trying to do that. And there's a risk that it could take another number of years to get there. Um, that would be a, a shame for the whole industry. The, the policy around you know, heating supports is, is, and, and bioenergy supports is, is, is poor in Ireland. Uh, one is north of the border, you know all the issues there, there's no point going into it. And the other is the REFA 3 um, scheme, which was meant to incentivize 150 megawatts of heat or of bioenergy, electricity, and has done a, a, a couple of, of megawatts. That can only be seen as a policy failure. And I think it was so complicated that it just wasn't fit for a purpose. Um, we need something that's much more simple. And, and, and that's a hard balance for the, the, the department to get. Um, there was a grant scheme around 2006, 2007, and a lot of us at that time worked full time, including myself in the bioenergy sector and built up that experience Tom has. Um, and, and, and those same individuals, as Tom says, are working overseas and have gone. So, 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 so I'd say to the department, try and get the, try not to make it too complicated, try not to do everything, try and do something that's, that's more limited. A grant scheme is, 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 is a simple way to do it and it had, a pro had its problems. There's other ways to incentivize um, things. I, I think of solar panels going up on the roof of all the new houses because there's a policy thing that you have to have a certain amount of renewable energy within a, a new build. Um, there's um, our, our, our car fleet has gone from big gas guzzlers into much more um, efficient things by a single policy thing that link tax the amount of carbon emissions. So the, 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 the renewable heat incentive is, is, is essential, but it's not the only thing, and keep it simple. I suppose that's my message to the department. Um, on this session now, it is being recorded, um, so if anyone has, has comments, this will feed into the RBS submission. Um, RBS, um, how we're going to deal with it is we have a re renewable um, uh, RHI group, which is currently chaired by Des O'Toole from Quiltia, and they'll be meeting in the next few days to discuss this as well. So if anyone wants to become involved beyond this session, um, get in touch with Urbia or with Des, and, and, and we'll try and feed in the comments. So just for now, I'll ask people to, to make a couple of comments. If anyone goes on for more than about a minute, I'm going to cut you off because we, we, we've limited time. Um, let's get the ball rolling by just asking people's initial view on the RHI consultation that's out there. Um, so if you want to raise your hand, and Noel will bring a mic to you. Nick? Hi, uh, yeah, uh, Nick Rackard, um, Rackard Steam and Biomass Services, um, and a member of the, <coughs> the European Management Committee. Uh, I suppose from a, a developer's perspective, at the moment there's not enough in the document to um, give any confidence to move forward with any kinds of projects. Uh, and that would be one, one observation. Uh, aside from that, I, I'd just like to ask Tom, is, is the only, in his view or in his, his study of, of uh, uh, the RHI, is the only way to deliver uh, a subsidy via a heat meter? Aren't there alternatives? Thank you. I, I, I don't know if I'd be offending industry by saying there's probably consensus that that did lead to some uh, rushed installations or inflated costs uh, out there. Uh, and also then when it came to an end, there was no, no sector, so to speak. Um, carbon tax, 
think it's a long-term aspiration to use that as a tool to promote uh, renewable uh, for, for decarbonisation of heat and energy efficiency. But the uh, SEAI model, the cost of that, it was on the table initially as a policy option. And so, no way we can put uh, 600 million of carbon tax on, 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 on every citizen in the country. It would be more, far more cost effective just to actually directly promote the, 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 the carbon neutral heating systems instead. That, that's uh, just a uh, couple of ways. Oh, thanks. Oh, sorry. So, so, so there's uh, a couple of ways uh, that that's our our on the table and are, have worked in the past, but uh, you know, definitely where, where you're at now is there's a concrete proposal with a lot of time and effort invested in it and the, the, the focus should be on grabbing that opportunity really, um, particularly given how long it's taken to, to conceive it uh, as such. You know. Anyone else with comments? Tom, yes, uh, Jared Cross from uh, Woodco Energy. Um, just uh, picked up on a point earlier this morning. Um, I think it was Fergal mentioned it that we'll pay pay uh, 130 million for every one percent that um, that the uh, we miss our targets, our 2020 targets. And it's just uh, the question I have is: Are we currently paying that fine, or is that something that will only become uh, payable on 2020? And surely, uh, 130 million. We're probably going to miss it by four percent. Surely, there's roughly six hundred thousand there that uh, would be available for an RHI. Is that the way the department are thinking, or um, uh, you know, and is, are the levies being paid at the moment? I don't know if this this is a personal Q and A, but I'm sure getting cues and I'm giving answers. You know, but the um, okay, I, I don't know what way the department are thinking directly, but uh, that, that I mean. Those fines are certainly not being paid now, and the earliest they would possibly become payable is around uh, 2022, when it becomes apparent that targets have been missed, and then there's a whole kind of process that starts off and a potential appeal process, and so, you know, you're looking at 2025 at least before, in, in my view, um, before. You say, oh, you're two governments away before anybody's worried about fines, and you know my, my own thinking on it is like, particularly in a in a, in, in a post Brexit climate, uh, people don't like to be. I, I'm certainly feeling personally. I, I don't like to be doing things just because the EU set out a directive or because there's a potential fine. <coughs> you know, it'd be fantastic to be thinking, well, we're we're doing this because it's in our national interests because. You know, climate change is happening. Uh, you know, and get more positivity and plan past 2020 and plan plan past fines. You know. uh, Mark Mark Arian from Evershed Sutherland. Um, it's just an observation. Um, on the refit two, which dealt with wind, it was a very simple system to comply. You literally had to provide evidence of planning land that you then turned into PPA, and then you were good for all time. Really, you're already in compliance with your REFIT 2 obligations. In REFIT 3, there was an ongoing requirement to comply uh, with your HECHP certificate. It, the language in the consultation documents was really complex. It's something you've mentioned already, Fred. Um, and so it was very hard from a, when you're structuring a deal, um, to actually convince a bank that you are going to be able to comply. Uh, or, or any other funder that you're going to be able to comply over all time of the length of the loan, for example, or the equity investment. Um, clearly, biomass is far more complex deals to get away than wind, which is sort of well structured and there's over you know 100 deals done on, on the island probably. Um, so just an observation, whatever comes out of this consultation has to be straightforward and easily digestible by the banking community and also all those people who advise banks such that we can get projects away because as you said Re refit 3 wasn't and we know what the results of that were um i suppose mark i fully agree with you this is one of my my personal rants that you know the wind industry um is, is very simple with there's a number of you in the room today but it, it's with respect to you like it's very simple there's this tower with three blades and they spin around and they're all exactly the same um you know the bioenergy one is a lot more complicated but from Ireland Inc.'s point of view, it brings a lot of other benefits, job creation, 
um, employment and, and, and all the other stuff that goes with it. And from Ireland's Inc's point of view, I think we need to resource it better so that within the wind industry, it's connected to electricity and there's a whole, whole host of um, agencies and associations that are working there, there's CR and there's ESB and there's networks and there's AirGrid and all of those which are, are professionally resourced and able to help it, while within the, the helping the heat sector and the, the departments and so on, I think they're under-resourced. And this is the thing that RB have been saying for a long time, that the individuals in the department are doing a very good job and they're very dedicated individuals, there just isn't enough of them. And that's something that needs to be beefed up um, to, 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 to get over these issues, like you mentioned, HGCHP and so on, um, that, to, to, to make it clearer and easier for, for projects to go ahead. Um, there's a few more questions. If, if, if we're not getting a lot of questions, what I might do is just go through this document and before Derek gets ready, two questions and, and I'll give you my answers to them first. How many people have seen this document and how many people, so most people, how many people have read it cover to cover? And I keep my hand down for that um, because it is, it is quite a detailed thing. So if we get a chance after it, we might go through it. There's about 10 or 12 questions in it. Um, and we might go through those very quickly, just so, so, so you know what's in there. Derek? Thanks, Fred. Um, I suppose just to address the question of emissions, and it's something I'll be, I suppose, touching on in the presentation after lunch. Um, the recommendation that we made in the report that we prepared for um, Erbia was the adoption of the UK um, RHI emission certificate system um, in the absence of a facility uh, permit applying to a site. Um, the emission system, the certificate system is in existence. It, um, just likely to cross over with the products that are already certified in the Irish market and coupled with quality uh, quality assured fuel um, can provide, I suppose, um, satisfaction really from an emissions control point of view to some extent. I suppose the reason we've met, we've referenced the um, facility permit uh, and a permit applying to uh, ELVs being applied through a permit to the recommendation is because the uh, consultation document, I think, needs to consider the implementation of the medium combustion plant directive that's coming down the line. So any plants between uh, 1 and 50 megawatts in scale are going to be captured by the requirements of the MCP. Now that's due for transposition by the end of this year and one would assume that there's going to be a regime in place within 18, 24 months. So there's a, a body of work there to see how those UK uh, emission certificates will interact with the MCP directive requirements in terms of the ELVs and in terms of how the ELVs act or uh, interact. The ELVs in the UK RHI uh, emission certificate system are measured in grams per gigajoule, whereas it's mi milligrams per meter cubed in the MCP directive. And when you actually do a comparison, they don't actually marry up quite well. So you could actually be compliant with the emission certificate system and non-compliant with the MCP directive when it comes in. So it's so certainly for the scale, the, obviously the scale of facilities greater than one megawatt. So there is a body of work, I think, to be undertaken there as well. And that's something to be considered from the emissions point of view. Yeah, yeah. And it'll be interesting to go over it in, in more detail later. Question on the left here or not? Um, when you were just talking about alternatives to a heat incentive, um, the book on our renewable gas comes to mind by Joe Abbas, and she's a very good overview of the whole biogas, bioenergy, and how it links with carbon and climate change and so on. And at the very end of it, having discussed all the various technologies and systems, she suggests that the best way to treat bioenergy is as an adjunct to the electricity grid, because in the end of the day, that's the only reliable technology we have to balance the grid with the amount of renewable that's coming on. And therefore, really, in, in that scenario, and again, thinking of other successful countries, it, it was municipalities, it was, it was the grid itself, and it should maybe be air grid, and uh, that would take on the heavy lifting in providing uh, renewable gas and renewable electricity, methylation again, all of those new systems in order to bring down our carbon budget. And then I, I have nothing to suggest then for um, privately provided, but certainly we, we need an injection of big finance quick. Um, uh, not relying on banks, not relying on uncertain grant aid, uncertain supply. So uh, this may be a job, as I say, for air grid and pay it through off balance sheet, low cost, 
put the technology and research in, make it work, and then you can look at uh, more private sector input once you have a model operating. Great, thanks for that. David? I won't take too much time since I spoke already, but just to add something to the, maybe the thought process around this, is that uh, if, like you take what I said earlier to be true, that bioenergy is, let's say, limited in the future, you could say that heat is, in theory, you could say the last place we want to use it in the long term. And, and the way that, way that we describe that is that heat is kind of like the lowest grade energy we currently use in the sense that you can create heat by burning practically anything, but you can't create transport from anything let's say, or you can't create electricity as easily. And that's typically why, when I talked earlier, the ideal way to produce heat from bioenergy, you could say, is somehow cascading the value of that bioenergy through something like a CHP plant, because you're effectively getting it as a, as a byproduct. But the challenge and the thing I caveat this statement with is, the wonderful thing about the heating sector is it's, let's say, a mature way of developing the supply chain for bioenergy. So you have this balance somehow between really mature technologies that could help develop the supply chain versus I would say Ireland Inc. in 20, 30, 40 years probably having better value for bioenergy in electricity and heat transport than it would in heating. And the thought process behind this in Denmark you could say to some degree is by developing bioenergy supply chains via things like district heating when transport becomes let's say mature enough to be able to bring bioenergy into it it's very easy to switch the production process at the beginning of the pipe compared to what it is switching the production process in every building, if that makes sense. So in other words, the bioenergy plants that they have producing heat on the district heating systems can very easily be replaced with like a large scale heat pump when the time comes where both that large scale heat pump is viable and the, let's say, bioenergy is more suitable in, in the transport sector. So it's just to add that uh, one of the, let's say, low hanging fruit for to solve both problems could be where you have a large industrial user that's currently throwing away its heat. If they were incentivized through the RHI to use biomass instead of, let's say, gas, but then get paid for the heat they're delivering via a network to a local area, you're then solving two problems Ireland has at once. You could say you're developing the network and you're getting the biomass supply chain and preparing for a switch at a later yeah. time. But just some yeah. food for thought. Thank you, David. I think as well we have to be very cognizant that we, we need to get boilers getting in straight away, however it's done. But we need to get back to that stage where we have an industry that's thriving and where there's you know uh, hundreds of people employed in it. Um, once we're at that stage and there's vans going around the country putting in boilers, then then we kind of move on to those which are a little bit further down the the, the, the line. But again, I fully support what you're saying there. Um, I think I'm going to. There's one more question here. Just, just one more question. So I know that the RHI is targeted, directly targeted at the non-residential sector. And if, as an association, you feel there's value in allowing for the aggregation or patching up, um, if as an association we feel that there's value in allowing for aggregation of, say, a package of 1,000 houses to be heated by biomass, that's something that would need to be explicitly allowed for in the RHI terms and conditions in terms of having less onerous requirements for, uh, for metering and for ongoing uh, compliance. So that's something that maybe we need to think about uh, in terms of a response. Thanks, Dara. J just a question from, has anyone started preparing submissions on the, on the RHI at this stage? One? Um, maybe half a dozen or so. Um, and again, we'd, we'd, we'd appreciate if anyone, and especially at that early stage, I feel when a number of different people are looking at it, that what happens so often is that one person sits down and writes a document and puts a lot of effort into it, and then that, that, that's the, the core of the idea. So it's very useful if people can do that separately and then feed in. Again, even if it's only bullet points or um, so on, I, I, I would encourage you to send them into our BIA so we can get a, the strongest response we can together. Um, I'm just going to flick through this document quickly because um, we have another 15 minutes or so. Um, and highlight it. Of course, it's, it's, it's 50 odd pages. So for those of you who haven't seen it, it gives an introduction. It um, mentions people who've responded to previous queries and, and, and consultations, consultations within the department. And then you get into a few questions. Um, so the, the, the first one here, we'll just spend maybe a minute or two, see how this goes on, on each of them. Um, the first, can you read those? Can I get full screen width for it? 
Is there anyone techie around who can... Um, So I suppose the first section there is, is to do with ETS sites, and, and, and my understanding of it is there's a missions trading scheme, and any units over a certain threshold, is it 20 or 50 megawatts, um, goes into the emissions trading. So those are all the power stations around the country in the big industry. Um, across Europe, it's about half the, the, the big energy users are, are in this. So the, the, the consultation currently excludes that, and that's what's been raised in previous versions of the, 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 the thing so far. Does anyone have strong feelings on ETS sites being left out of, left out of the, the RHI? You don't have to be strong, just an opinion. <laughs> just, uh, just wondering, in terms of if you do leave out the ETS sector, do you have any idea as to what the size of the non-ETS industrial heat sector would be? Yes, it was a big part of our analysis um, and the previous consultation. Uh, so it's, it's, it's available on the Erbia website, the submission that was put in, and uh, it pretty much highlights the impact of excluding ETS um, and, and the market limitation of that. Just move on to the, the, the next one. This is to do with if you're supplying renewable heat, and this is the issue up in the north, um, and, and in the UK as well. Um, is it right that you should get paid an incentive out of extractor money to heat a warehouse that has nothing in it? Um, is it right that you should be heating a uh, chicken shed with no chickens in it, for example? Um, you know, those are the, the, the kind of things that come up. And then how do you, how do you control it in such a way that, that, that that stops? So if this hotel here was to put in a boiler, um, how do you ensure that they don't um, turn on the heat uh, when there's no guests here and, and, and pump it in? Um, I think that's already covered within the tiering system within this. So as Tom says, the more you use, the less you get paid. Um, that's been the, 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 the issue in the north. Um, and I think that there's a couple of questions about this within the, the consultation about trying to control that. Um, I'm involved in a, a different role with the... Um, the HECHP criteria, which was used in, within Refit 3, and there's a lot of um, you know confusion within the industry of how you do that. And that, just to give a very quick background on it, is you get paid various different incentives if a CHP unit is high efficiency. Um, so as Tom said, there's one in, in, in this building here. But then the risk is that all the heat is used for uh, um, a, a use that isn't a, a real use, um, and people get incentivized just to, to, to waste heat. So how do you go about it? Um, Again, I think everyone would feel that that it should be used for a proper use, and I think it's the next question here is to do with exceed, um, and, and 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 the exceed process is something new. It's a, an acronym for um, um, excellence in energy efficiency design. Um, I've worked on a project on that for a, a biomass installation, which is would be about two megawatts heating um, about eight or twelve buildings um, in an industrial park. And we've looked at the exceed model, and it is horrendously complicated. And if it's something that you're not doing day in, day out, it's something that's that's um, that, that, that's pretty tough to do. Um, it, it, what it does is it certifies that you're doing. Like as an engineer, if you're building a building, you do it energy efficiently, and you do it to the best ability you can. It's having a, a systematic approach to demonstrate that that has been done. Um, does anyone have comments on? those two questions, one over energy efficiency and the other over exceed in, in particular. Nick? Can everyone hear Nick? Uh, there's been a number of comments about looking at uh, overseas and the experience overseas and the fact uh, there was one comment there that we're actually late to the game in terms of incentives that we can learn from the others uh, in the north or the UK. That's fine, but we should also be looking at existing incentives that have actually been implemented here in Ireland and the success, or namely the lack of success of those, and I refer specifically to, to Refit 3 uh, Biomass CHP. Uh, and there's a, 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 an incentive that was 
set the bar too high and the incentive too low. And while there was a lot of interest and a lot of uh, investment in in bringing projects to market, there were, it was very difficult to get to, get them banked at the end of the day. So uptake is low. Any other comments on efficiency or exceed? Has anyone else been involved in an exceed project? Would you give any opinions? <laughs> and don't if you don't want to. So just to add to, uh, to uh, in relation to the minimum energy efficiency eligibility criteria, I suppose the point there would really echo just uh, from Board of Mona would be just uh, to echo the point that Mark Varian made, the Eversheds and the what the bankers and etc. And it was to look for simplicity. Simplicity is, is key to making this thing happen. And uh, just to refer back to the HECHP and the, the difficulties in actually getting that over the fence and you know, the way to avoid that is through simplicity. Certainly for, for clarity, the, the HECHP process is probably simple compared to EXCEED, uh, in, in, in my opinion. Um, the, the other one on the table there is the BER, like so, so okay, an industrial site, that doesn't suit, but uh, a building like this, like, are there views there on the, the before and after commercial BER as, as, as a tool for that? Yeah? Because that's that's what's on the table where, where you where you would be able to do the ER. Um, yeah. Sorry, my name is Mark Anderson from Ulster University. Just very quickly, one very simple way of, of solving your efficiency problem is to never have an incentive which is more than the cost of production at any stage. That that flat lines that nobody's going to run it unless they need to. That's from an engineer's point of view and not a developer or a financial point of view. If it takes the case that you have to put, to get this in, you have to have a higher incentive. It has to be kept very, very low in the tiering system so that it's minimal, yeah. maybe even less than 10%, but a very high figure so that as soon as somebody gets over that, they've financed their package, but then they're incentivized never to run it more than, than the level. But it's probably the simplest yeah. way of doing that. And, and, and Mark, my, my, I think that's captured within the proposal of the, the, the document so far. Again, for people who haven't seen it, um, Urbia put a submission together that uh, Tom's company um, wrote on our behalf about a year ago, um, and I'd strongly encourage you to read that. It's on the Urbia website, and it goes into a lot of um, a, a lot of detail over that in particular. Um, and and, and I, I think it's very welcome that a lot of those um, suggestions are picked up within this consultation process. Sorry, Paul O'Reilly is my name, uh, Energy Consultants. Just a quick comment in relation to the BER as a, as a reference method uh, for energy efficiency. I, mean, I do think it makes tremendous sense that, um, that it is a minimum reference, a minimum BER standard. Uh, arguably, the higher the standard, the better, because you think about it every... We don't, you don't want, you know, obviously want to avoid a cash flash situation where energy generated by a building is inefficiently being used so the higher the energy rating, the more less likely it'll be inefficiently used in the first instance, irrespective of costs. So I'd certainly suggest you know, that as high as an A rating should be a minimum standard, even if that is for a hotel, um, because then you know, it's, it's an, an less energy used is the, should be the priority in any event. Um, in relation to the EXCEED um, program, it is, as you say, fairly complex, but if it is a complex industrial building or a process, why not use the exceed as a methodology for minimum standards for acceptance into the OHI scheme? So I think that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Because there's a number of questions within this, I'm just going to keep going. It's, it's as much to introduce everyone to the, the, the issues in this and get some quick feedback. Um, the next one is to do with minimum um, standards with, with, within it, as is shown on the screen there. Um, the challenge within that is there's a triple A register that SEAI holds and, and only super efficient products can get onto that um, and a number of biomass boilers are there. Um, there's another issue to do with the design and the installation of that. So currently anyone can design a biomass boiler and a bit um, embarrassingly I give the, an example of, of my one of the first designs I did was for a local school down in Clare. And 
pretty well. I was 24, 26 at the time, and I designed this system. Um, and we installed it, and, and we got the contract because I knew the principal there. Um, and that winter, it just wasn't big enough. And the school was shut for three weeks because there wasn't enough, um, enough heat for the building. So, uh, you know, as, as, as a personal thing, it was, it was hugely embarrassing um, professionally as well. But also there was a question there of whether I, as a 24, 26-year-old engineer, should have been um, allowed to design a system for a building where, schools, where kids have to go to school. Um, and should the company be, have let me and should the country, Ireland Inc., have let someone with so little experience have done it? Um, my view is that we need some regulation around the designers for systems like this, or these issues will happen again. Arbia did a survey a number of years ago where 40% of the installations, the biomass installations, were switched off at the time of the visit that was done. Um, so there's a huge issue around there, and I'd encourage people who are making submissions to to, to, to suggest ways in which the, the, both the design and the installation could be regulated in a way which makes it better for the rest of the industry. Because again, from an industry's point of view, if an RHI comes in and it doesn't work, we're all going to be out of business in another three years and, and, uh, uh, and looking for something else. Um, any comments around that, that question and, and, and those issues? I'm going to move on if, 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 if there isn't. Um, the, the, the next question, which is here, I know I'm flying through this document, is, is to do with what we talked about earlier, which is a proper use of the heat, so to do with energy efficiency, to do with how that's, how that's done and whether there's a proper use for it. So I'm going to skip past that one again. Um, the next one here is about the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme. So I'm aware that this is a scheme that has been, um, that's been set up by industry with stakeholders from the Department of Agriculture, from Chagas, um, from WIT and SEAI, and it's Pat'll know better. Um, a number of years ago, this was, was first muted and, and, and has helped the, the, the supply of biomass so that you know that if you're buying wood chip or wood pellets or, or firewood, it is what it says on the tin. So it's not, you don't get a heavy bag with a load of water in it or heavy, heavy wood chip. And there's some kind of regulation around that. Um, it's, it, it, the, the, so, 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 so it's been a big improvement for the users of, of fuel that have this, this certificate on it. Do people have views on whether WFQA should be mandatory for RHI users? Um, I, I'm aware that there's a lot of people who aren't um, WFQA certified as well. Derek? I suppose just make a point about what about non woody fields? Um, straw, for example. Um, what's the proposal for uh, quality assurance of that fuel, or is there a proposal for quality assurance of that fuel? I know you, I the question, know. you don't know the answer, but it's something that maybe needs to be considered as part of the, the further scheme development. And from an emissions point of, from an emissions point of view, um, yeah, it's very beneficial to see references to WFQA as a uh, mandatory requirement, um, given the influence that wood fuel quality can have on emissions. It certainly should be coupled with the emission certificate scheme that we referenced earlier on as well. Um, there may be a valid question as to whether if something like a MCP directive does come in and applies endpoint emission limit values that are constantly, consistently monitored, whether there is a Requirement for wood fuel quality assured, uh, quality assured wood fuel as well. I suppose that's a question that maybe should be put to the department in consultation responses. But certainly for something that doesn't, for a facility that doesn't operate under a, a permit or facility in terms of ELVs, and certainly the coupling of quality wood, uh, wood fuel to the emission certificate system would be of significant benef benefit from an emissions point of view. Thank you. Anyone else on WFQA? There's one here in the front. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Tom Sheehy, Clear Power. Um, firstly, uh, an initial comment would be I'd support, or we would support certainly, that um, WFQA accreditation would be mandatory under RHI scheme or application. Um, whether it is or it isn't, uh, well, certainly if it is the case um, going forward, you know, uh, it's no different to SEI administrat uh, ad administrating the overall scheme, you know, the, the WFQA and, and Pat Murphy is probably better equipped to answer, would need um, just to ensure that there would be a resource there to uh, deal with maybe a, a glut or, or a rush to, to, to get certification. That's just, you know, a comment from our perspective, you know, that's all. 
Okay. Thanks, Tom. Kenneth? Hello, Kenneth Wall, Wall Harvesting. Just on the whole uh, brash side, it needs to be included that brash can be used in these boilers, and it seems to be pushing away from that the whole time. And I think that the system should be structured some way to encourage brash. Yeah, good comment. Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, if, if anyone has a question on that, do, do come back to it. The, the next one is, um, is linked into. Um, to Derek's point and his, his, his work later on is to do with um, PM and NOx emissions and PM are uh, particulate matter and they come in various sizes down to tiny. Um, biomass when you burn it, bits of soot go up the chimney, that's just the way it is. Um, as a country it's an area that hasn't been regulated very much so far so very often you'll go into a, a place and you'll smell the biomass boiler, you shouldn't be able to smell it in other countries you can. And that basically means that the, the, the particulate matters and the, the stuff coming out the flue isn't being lifted high enough up into the air. So when you drive around other countries like in Denmark or Sweden or, or, or other countries, the, the flues or the chimneys coming out of these systems are massive. Um, I discussed a, a system I worked in, working on up in um, Donegal, two megawatt one, that's going to have an 18 meter high flue, which is, which is massive. You can see it from, from miles away. Um, if you don't have these, you're going to have issues with that. And by lifting them up, it basically disperses it more. Um, my view on it, and, 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 and there's, a, there's a parallel issue going on to do with clear, clean air in Ireland and the Department of the Environment are very nervous that a load of biomass goes in that isn't regulated and, um, and, and, and there's particular matter and worse air quality in the cities and that's got public health risk as well. Um, my view on it is there's only one answer to this. This has to be done properly. It has to be, you can engineer out a lot of these systems. You can put various uh, filters and cyclones and stuff to take the particulates and the noxes out, um, but it costs money. Um, the RHI has to be at a level that can incentivize that. Um, so, 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 so to me, that's, that's, a, that's a very clear answer to this question. Does anyone have other views on it? Um, I'm going to go on to the, the next one. Okay, so I was hoping to, um, so this is to do with sustainability of, of, of biomass. Um, in, in, in short, we shouldn't be cutting down rainforests to do this. We shouldn't be cutting down um, forestry that hasn't been properly managed um, in, in, in Ireland. We shouldn't be um, burning, burning waste in boilers. Um, what are realistic sustainability criteria that is needed for the RHI? Um, Again, my view on it is that we have some of the best forestry in Europe, in the world. It's some of the best regulated forestry already. And by putting a bar up, which includes something like some additional certification on it, is going to be very onerous. There's already, what is it, the um, EU timber trading regulations that we're all meant to be complying with. There's a lot of regulation there already. Um, in a previous um, a job I looked at certification of private um, growers with the Irish wood producers who are here today. Um, it's, it's a horrendously complex system and I see this as, as something a bit similar to exceed with, with goodwill um, the RHI could have something imposed on it which is such a bureaucratic headache that it, it, it signs the whole thing and stops it going ahead. Um, so again those, that's, that's my tuppence. Um, any views from the floor on that and in particular to these questions that are, are listed here? It would kind of help if you had questions, because then I can prep for the next one. Yeah, well, there, there, there's, there, there's nine of them just on sustainability uh, alone there to digest, Fred. But the, the one that's uh, really caught, caught my attention is the last one there when I first read this. Uh, like should, should, should a tariff be linked to the CO2 profile of your fuel? And if not, why not? <laughs> can anyone currently supplying fuel imagine that? So you're going to have to respond to this or write something about it. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> Is everyone hungry? <laughs> <laughs> I'll come in there, Fred. Jack O'Connor, BHSL. 
I, I just quit on the emissions one. You know, I think in our recent history, uh, we've had trouble previously with supports around, I mentioned pellet boilers, etc. And I think, you know, we should be so careful here on all this one on the emissions. We'll be watching, the, the public will be very mindful of what's been on the airwaves over the last couple of months uh, next door to us. And they will also be very mindful of um, a, a word Jacqueline Balin used from Ofgem that quite a bit of gaming goes on. So when it comes to the emission piece, um, we game at our peril, you know, and we look at the limits that, um, that are allowed under EU regulation and not only go with those limits, but see, can we come in under them? We saw with the, the wood chip boilers where ceramic filters just had to be used in the UK and that was it. There was a 10, 10 uh, uh, the 3150 rule had NOx and particulate. We should be looking at that as a target and even below it. But um, it's not just about the regulation. This is about what, what the neighbours, you know, see and what does Joe Duffy hear at two o'clock. If there's, if there's a biomass boiler out there, any kind of a boiler, that has smoke of any sort, or even water vapour coming from it, just that the image is gone straight away and this thing would be dead in the water before it starts. You know, we're not, we're not starting from a good place, so we have to be squeaky clean. It. So I think we should have the rigidest of standards in there. And there's, there's no reason why we can't. Okay, just for the sake of... Pat? Just to address the question of being ready to certify in companies for the RHI. If you're worried about having a queue to join the Wood Fuel Quality Assurance Scheme, we have application forms here for you today. Get started now. Get it in process. It's not a rubber stamp that will take you time, but it's a simple process that we will help you through. So my advice is, get moving on it now. Get the quality into the industry sooner rather than later. Fred, uh, you, uh, I, I'm just very conscious that there's been no feedback about the, the, a huge part of this is still biogas and grid injection and biomethane. And if there's any stakeholders there want to uh, see if they've identified any surprises, good or bad, uh, within what they've seen so far, it'd be quite interesting. While you think over that, I'm going to go through the, the rest of them a little bit quicker. There, the, a lot of the rest of them are, are kind of related to the tariffs and the rate and, and, and so on. Um, and this is, again, just to make uh, jog people's memory on, on the questions they're getting. Um, this one is, are the uh, tariff differentiation by technology right? So that means that if you've got a, a wood pellet boiler, should it get a different payment to a wood chip boiler or to biogas or, 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 or so on? Um, the, the, the next question is to do with the um, the, the, the tiering approach which Tom went into in, in, in a bit of detail there and that stops basically what happened up in the north where you could run a boiler for 8,000 hours a year you could leave the windows open and you get paid the higher rate which was more than the cost of the fuel and that's what the whole issue was about in the UK it's tiered um, to a, a certain level there's two tiers on it and then within the, this document it gives one graph which I won't be able to find probably which, which suggests a number of tiers that it goes down it starts off at you know, say 10 cent, then after a thousand hours drops down to eight, and after another thousand it goes down to six and four and three and so on. Those numbers aren't accurate, but that gives, gives the idea behind it. Um, I'm going to skip that. The, 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 that's a suggested tiering within the, the document. So it starts off at, uh, no, it's not, sorry. Um, the, the, the next discussion is about the time frame for the support. So it mentions I think is it 5, 10, 15 and 20 years or something like that. Do you get paid quite a lot of money for five year support or do you get a longer payment which again is happening within the UK and, um, and, and Northern Ireland. The, the refit um, schemes are all 15 year schemes as well. Um, so there's, there's advantages to the exchequer in giving a, a single payment up front which is in the form of a grant or you can tear it over or, 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 or spread it over the lifetime of it. Um, that's that's a similar one. Um, there's then a question to do with metering. I think this is a th this is important as well. Um, and basically, what this says is, if you have a hotel like this um, and you use um, X thousand megawatt hours of heat a year, should that be metered, or can you take it that a hotel of this size needs? Um, you work out the floor area, and there's there's various best practice guides that say it needs um, you know three and a half thousand megawatt hours a year. As long as you don't use more than that. 
um, you can get paid the whole lot on it. The advantage of that is it hugely simplifies the administration of the scheme. Um, the, the, uh, um, so there's a question on there again. By, by not metering it would make it a lot simpler for users to, 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 to use the scheme. By metering it gives more surety for the, um, for, for, for the, the I suppose, the, the, the government and the payers of the scheme. But it also adds an administration, administrative issue to it. Yeah, actually, the, the paper suggests that, that encourages energy efficiency. So you're not getting paid any any additional. You get a deemed quantified amount, and there's no incentive to overheat or overproduce by having a deemed amount. Uh, Nick here again, Fred. Um, on the metering thing, th that's okay for space heating, but when you're into industrial processes, uh, there's a great variance, and I think there would be maybe need for. Uh, something that's actually relates to the process and the demand for that particular process. Yeah. The only other problem with deeming your heat is you have no incentive to run your boiler at all. Yeah. Put it in and, and, and away you go. So, and Nick earlier asked was there an option other than metering? And I think it was the RBA's domestic fuel group had a submission in a while back about um, paying on fuel. I think it's something else that should maybe be considered. You can definitely, if somebody puts in a fuel invoice certified by WFQA, we can make sure we're not spending more than the cost of the fuel. And if they also put in a meter reading, we can work out the efficiency of every single unit. And then you have the option of paying a little more if you've got a high efficiency unit rather than a low efficiency unit. You know, yep. and that very, very easy, quickly, no, no, no tearing, no, no tariffing, and that very quickly simplifies that as well. Yeah. Which is a quick one, really, raising the same issue. I think, I think it has to be metered. I think the efficiency isn't been monitored and measured if there's no, if there's no metering system. And I appreciate that's making things a little more complex, but it has to be essential. And the more than I would refer earlier to the BORs and the Exceed, I appreciate that they're also making it more complex. But they are part of what needs to happen is to make these things measurable and efficiently measurable. Um, Tony Connolly from Fingers and White. Um, just a, a couple, I, I totally agree in terms of metering and the importance of that, but I would also agree with the importance of energy efficiency. And yeah, the big thing of all of this is that, you know, the, the kilowatt hour that's not burnt is, is definitely the best way of doing it. In terms of the inclusion of the ETS, I think that's a very important um, part of the RHI. Um, I suppose they talk in a number of our clients where we have, you know, large CHP plants in terms of industrial, and there's been a lot of investment in the last number of years in new plants, um, generating very efficient heat. And I would think that there's a big issue for these companies as they look to, I suppose, decarbonize their heat. And unless we get biogas and injection into our systems, we have a lot of technology that really, you know, there's no way forward for it. And in terms of reliable heat and uh, that, I think it's very important that biomethane injection is definitely considered in the RHI. Um, thanks for that. It is good to, to, to look at some of the other technologies as well. Nick? Yeah, just to come back on the metered heat versus the DMT, I think the DMT is a risky proposition and can easily be replaced by the proposal on um, to calculate it on the basis of the energy contained in the fuel bot. That should be, and if it's tied into WFQA certification, then that's a very simple, straightforward way of doing it. Um, I'm getting devil looks from our chairman, so I'm going to go through the, the three remaining questions. Um, very quickly. One is to do with CPI. How should, if we start getting a rate at 10 cents, should that be 10 cents for 15 years or should be linked to CPI? Um, the next, which isn't on the screen, is to do with um, digression of the tariffs. And what that means is that to incentivize the market and just think that the market is on its knees or the industry is on its knees, do you offer a high incentive in year one to get it going? Do you offer 10, 15 cents to get it going with an understanding that once the first batch of people are into it, that rate will drop down to 8 cents? or six cents, or as people come in, it'll support it and it'll reduce the capital cost of an installation. Uh, to me, that makes sense, um, and, and it, it, it's done in, in the UK as well. Um, so it means that people are getting paid, you know, not the minimum, but they're not getting paid a huge amount at the start, because if, if somebody goes to design a, a boiler now, the boiler's going to be more expensive. If there's 300 being sold every year in Ireland, the price of the design and the equipment and so on is going to come down. Um, 
The last one which I have on the screen is um, to do with pre-accreditation of bigger systems. And again, that goes back to some of the issues with the Aretha Tree scheme. Um, if, 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 if you want to invest in one of these for, say, a big facility, if you're a big industrial site and you're putting in a, a boiler of a number of megawatts, four, five, ten megawatts, there's a, a handful of those in the country, um, they will take probably a year plus to, to, to go, at least to go from conceptual design into installation. Um, if you do that, and they've digressed the scheme so much that you thought you were getting 10 cents a unit to make your, your, your decision. It takes two years to get it in and you're only getting 3 cents a unit. Um, it, 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 it makes a big risk for people as well. Um, and how do you go about ensuring that that, that people do it? So a pre-accreditation is, is, is an approval in principle for it so that you put in a, a, an outline of the design. You, do, you might do a five-page document. <laughs> Um, and then if you build it according to what you've said you would, then you get the, 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 the funding for the 15 years. Um, any queries on those three issues I've just done very quickly? Anyone asleep? Um, okay, apologize for going over that so quickly. I think it's important. This is, this is absolutely vital to our industry. If this RHI doesn't start, um, there's not much point 200 people coming and sitting in a room. So I know this is laborious, I know it's, um, it's tough to go through, but I think it's equally incredibly important that people are at least aware of the questions and issues. Um, if you have any thoughts on these, and again, if they're only bullet points, if you haven't done big submissions before, it doesn't have to be a 30-page document, but it's three or four bullet points that comes to your mind and you send it by email in through any of the channels into our we would hugely appreciate that. Um, if you have more time and if you're in an organisation that has the funding to help um, put submissions together, there is a voluntary committee working with, with, with the executives working for the association. If you're able to supply someone to give a day or two or, or, or longer to work on this, we hugely appreciate that as well. Um, thank you for your time.